My friend's in a fight. I got, where's the chair? That's what I'm thinking. The chair is going over someone's head. I, where, where I can see, you know what I mean? And I'm glad that I'm not that person anymore. What's up, good people? Welcome to another edition of Flex Your Head. I'm your host, Jesse Leach. It is my absolute honor and pleasure to have Roger Moret from Agnostic Front. He's also got a great band called Roger Moret and the Disasters. And he's a kingpin and one of the founding fathers of the New York City hardcore movement. I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't be the musician I am today or even the person that I am without hardcore. And Agnostic Front had a major part in that. Uh, he came out with a great book, which you'll hear about in the interview. So without further ado, check it out, man. I just want to get right into it with you, man. I figured it's good to just start at the beginning. I consider myself to be kind of a history buff, whether it's New York City or, or music or punk or hardcore. So this is an honor and it's actually really exciting for me to be able to pick your brain. So take me back. Take me back to New York in the 1980s. Paint a scene for me for people who haven't read your book, which is now out and it's an amazing book. Give us some insight to New York City in the 1980s and where you grew up the neighborhood you grew up in and what you had to go through, like, real quick. New York City in the 1980s was an amazing place. I like, you know, when I think about it, it's strictly like it's weird. I don't think about it as a very colorful era in my life. It's strictly dark. It's strictly like a black and white scenery in my, in my, in my head, you know? And that's what it was. It was a, it was a dangerous, but creative place where the color comes in place hmm. are in my memories of all the bands that were starting out, that were bringing all this dark but beautiful colors into the scene, like your Ramones, like your Blondie, you know, your Misfits, and then Stimulators. Yeah. You know, we could keep going from there. The Bad Brains, Urban Waste, Agnostic Front, you know, Chromax, Murphy's Law, it just kept spiraling, spiraling, spiraling. But bef even before a lot of that happened, we also had a, an amazing art scene. New York City, being that it was such a dark and nasty and rough place, some of the most beautiful stuff came out of it. It's like, I, I like to, I, I, the way I like to explain it is like, it's like a, an ugly desert, kind of black, ugly desert that you, you probably don't see. And in the middle of it, there's a beautiful flower from all angles. And that's what, that's the creativity like of that. it, man. Like it really that. was. It's like, it's hard to even describe. Like, I've had people come to me that, that, that listen to Victim of Pain and been to New York lately. And they're like, oh, I don't understand. Like, you're not going to understand because it ain't the same. Yeah, I mean, it, New York changes every you know? couple of years, never mind how it, different it is. Probably not only now. that, it was, but that element of danger mm. was, was the excitement that created such great music, created such great art because you needed those elements. To, to really be so creative? Because how, how do you get something so beautiful out of something so ugly? Which is you know, most of the music City. that I, I enjoy listening to, most of the art that I enjoy comes from dark places. Exactly. I think it's interesting though, I mean, obviously because of uh, you know, New York being where it was, you know, financially broke and mm -hmm. you have these vacant empty buildings which you were able to squat in. And you know, where I grew up in Providence, it was the same thing. We had a warehouse district back in the 90s where we had punk rockers opening up uh, clubs, you know, places for uh, bands to come and play. Did you see any of that? Were there squats where you could go play and like it was just a community and hang out back then? Pretty much it? that was all it really was. But we didn't, there were squat shows, of course, that existed, but and even the, just the actual clubs were cool and they were affordable. It's not like you needed to, to have these squat shows. It was just going to a show in New York City back then was, I mean, $3 to get in or at most, for most of us, free, because we we're all playing all the bands that played. Yeah, yeah. You know, or like, I mean, what really made the scene bigger and broader and, and kind of brought in other people was the CBGB's era. Mm. Because all of a sudden, now you have your CBGB's matinees. Yeah, yeah. That which, all of a sudden, like, yep. nobody wanted to go to, to the Lower East Side in 1981, 82, to go to the A7 club where a show started at one in the morning. Not, not your normal kid would do that. Don't forget some of these kids are at home and they're like, how do you get out of your house? How do you come out of your window, go to a show and come back in? So see, that was hard. And if you did that mission, it was, it was a special mission. And once you were there in this 
crazy, drug-infested, full of criminals area, you felt safe because you were among your peers and we all accepted mm. you. Anybody that knocked on the door of the A7 Club, we welcomed because it took a lot of, can you curse? Because it took a lot of balls. <laughs> can do whatever I've been want, doing man. all this radio, I mean, I, I'm doing like little in stores and, and there's kid, there's a little kids everywhere. I'm like trying not to say a bad word, you know, but anyway, what I'm trying to say, yeah. it took a lot of balls to go there. <laughs> yeah. So now you got CBGBs where it's in the middle of the day where you could tell your mom, you're going to go, oh, I'm going to go play softball over here right, or something. Right. And then you'll be back in time for dinner. And you just saw one of the most amazing hardcore shows ever. That's incredible. Which is really cool. So you mentioned, you mentioned the fact that you, you felt safe. I'm really into that idea of being a kid, and I didn't have a crazy upbringing, but I never felt like I fit in until I found hardcore, until I found punk rock, and I met people who thought the way that I did and, and listened to the kind of music that I did. Where was, was there an actual moment where you recognized that you found your tribe, or did it gradually happen? I'm glad you said tribe, because that's how I always say it. And no one's ever said anything like that, you know? And it was a tribe. And it really was, because we weren't a gang. A lot of people want to associate things to gangs. Gangs had different mentalities, especially back then, because we dealt with gangs. Mm. Most of the gangs in the Lower East Side were moving drugs. It was all shooting galleries or some sort of criminal activity. We didn't want any of that. We just wanted a show. And every show was in the middle of the worst area all over America, you mm. know? So. Yeah. When I found my tribe, which is what I really like to say, and we behaved like a tribe, we protected each other, because mm. once we knew, because I was just like you, I was just like you, I, I was always a loner, an outsider, a misfit, I never felt like I belonged, and going from, it didn't help that my upbringing was moving every six months or five months because my mom couldn't make rent or whatever, and I was constantly moving, so I couldn't make any friends, so I just gave up on making friends, like what's the point, you know, I'm going to be moving. You know? Yeah. And I always felt outside, you know? So not until I went to my first show at Max's Kansas City to go see the Bad Brains and the Beastie Boys <laughs> did I find people, I'm like, wow, this is it, man. And prior to that, I was going to shows. Prior to that, I, I saw the Misfits in New York. Mm -hmm. I seen the Clash numerous times, Bond Street, Shea Stadium. I saw the Clash Capitol Theater in New Jersey. But that moment, in Max, Kansas City, I really felt connected. I really did feel connected. And it's a shame that it was at the end of it. I only got to see two shows. Yeah. Because then everything started. And it was one of the, it was at the end of it when things were just starting to move harder to the A7 Club. Mm. But, you know, it was an amazing show. And that, sh that show changed my life. And, it, and, you know, for me, growing up and listening to, to Agnostic Front, that shit changed my life. And I was saying earlier to you, uh, I didn't have cable, we couldn't afford it, but my, my friend had cable and MTV came on and they had Anthem on and within that week I had a shaved head and combat boots on and, and I still am that same kid from that day. It changed my life, hardcore changed my life and it's, it's something I'm gonna go to the grave being and saying that I'm a hardcore kid, I'm a hardcore guy. And I think that's important to, to raise to people who are watching, who are listening, who are music fans, is knowing your history, knowing where you're the band that you like, when we talk about going back, you know, you hear a band that you like, you, you're into Metallica, for example, you mentioned the Misfits. Metallica was fans of the Misfits. Absolutely. And I think that that kind of stuff is getting lost with the age of the internet, some people, but it's important to really know your history. And uh, I, I just love hearing about old New York and where New York City hardcore started, because it's still thriving. It's yeah. still thriving. Well, did you get to see that video we just recently released called Old New York, How Much We Miss Old no, New York? It's a, no. It's got footage of Old New York, and I, I, I'm not trying to plug it or nothing, but it's, a, it's, it. it's, it's it, no, it's so, it's so cool. <laughs> it's old. It's like two years old right now, whatever. Right. It's my last record. But we shot this live in a train, uh, totally guerrilla style. Meet here, everybody. And we kept taking all the equipment out, all the equipment in, and shooting. At every, and then when people come in and stop, we stood still. And in between, we start, and the people like people like taking their phones, like what's going on? Do you have a behind the scenes of that shit? Like, we should. That shit it was totally funny. guerrilla style. Like who does that? No permits, no nothing. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like nobody does anything like that anymore. And and people jumping all over the place, and we're playing as a train is moving yeah. through all of New York. You know? But I mean, I I. I I totally, I totally get where you're coming from because I've always told anyone, if the minute you get into something and you feel like you, want, you are passionate about it, 
research your history, research mm. the roots, see where everything comes from. You know, it's always good to question everything anyway. If, if, what and about you if you got into something that you, that you don't even know what you got into? Exactly. You know, exactly. Like, and you might discover a band that you may like even better than absolutely. that band. And that was the way it was back then. We didn't have, no, we didn't have the internet. Right. Our, our social media was actually incredible. It was real. It was, hey, Jesse, I'm Roger. Nice to meet you. <laughs> no doubt, right? It was just like this. <laughs> it's so unpersonal today. Yeah. You know, until, until you meet somebody. Mm. And it becomes a little bit more personal, but it, it was it was so personal back then. Like for me, the way I discovered bands was not only by going to these shows, going to the going to Rat Cage Records, right? And and Dave playing a, a record for me. They just came in. He goes, "Listen to this." Like, Whoa! Then I take that record, flip it over, see who they thank. I'm yeah. like, and then he he had those who play those, and that's that's how everything happened. That was our social media. Yeah. And then you had to write to these people, write to these bands, you know, and then. It would take months to get a response, you know, like it wasn't like today, like you could, you, you know, like just think about this. We, we love similar bands. Think about what just, just, just think about the Sex Pistols right now. Mm -hmm. If the Sex Pistols were a band today, they wouldn't even do a quarter of the impact. I don't even think an eighth of the impact that they had in 1976. Yeah, you're right. They would be shut down overnight. Yeah, they come from protesting their shows. They, would, they come that, from yeah. an era, the same era I come from, where politically incorrect was correct. Right. If you know what I mean. No, I know exactly what you mean. I was raised around the same type of people, working class people. Where we were like, you know, say what you, say what you want to say, and it was fuck the system. Yep. You know, fuck the establishment. You know, this is what we were. This is, I mean, this is, you know, like. Just and it you know, still rings true so, today. Yeah. <laughs> no, you know, no rules. Just, yeah. just be yourself and it was so great to find my peers and other people in different bands that felt like i did you know and we all had our own little style but it was really weird it kind of was similar our tribe was we had a really cool looking tribe you know oh yeah we were some pretty badass you know indians back then so say it's, all this being said i'm really curious you know because i'm sure that you you when you were younger if i can assume you probably didn't think you'd make it to where you are right now oh no man you know, how, um, how does that like, do you have moments when you're like on tour or on stage where you're like in that moment? You know, it's easy when you're on tour, just you go, 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 go. But do you ever have those moments where you're like, shit, I can't believe I'm still doing this shit. I can't believe I'm still alive. Do yeah. you know what I like to say? It's, it's you know, I, I get moments where sometimes I do bum out, honestly, you know, because, you know, I'm 53 years old and I'm, and, and I, and I, I love what I do, and that's all I know what to do. I mean, right. I've got other things I can do, but um, basically, I like to I like to put it out this way: like, you know, people work their asses off till they're 63, 64, 65 to retire. Then they retire, and then they gotta enjoy life. But well, I've been living my retirement. Hell yeah! I've been enjoying <laughs> life oh, to great. a full extreme. That's great. And yeah. then when I be, when I get to 63, 64. Yeah, I'll go work. Yeah. You know? <laughs> That's so and good. And I'll go work Just till I drop it. dead. I flipped it. Yeah. I'm living it, you know? And it's an amazing life. So, it, you yeah. know, just touring the world. And yeah. just seeing things. That's, what, that's what's so special to me. It's like, I look, I, sometimes I sit back and I listen to people and I watch people. And especially just people that have never even left states, yeah. you know? And they, are, they have no idea what the rest of the world, no idea what, the, what it's like to see the world. And I want my children to do it somehow. You've yeah, got to yeah. go out there. You've got to go see things for yourself. I've always been that way, like question authority, question society. And well, it's you, so different when you're there and what you see. Yeah, you get a different perspective. You know, yeah. I always tell people who are so caught up in what's going on in this country, if you get out of this country and you see the way the rest of the world is seeing what's going on, it'll change your perspective. You'll see a bigger picture. And I think you hit it right on the head. I think travel is one of the most important things. If I were to recommend to any young person about what to do or whatever, definitely travel. You know, and, and speaking of which, you know, like, if you sit back and think about all these punk hardcore scenes all over the world, and there's only one that's been very magical that I feel that's bridged all these countries together, and that's New York hardcore. And influenced it as yeah. well, for sure. And, and for some reason, the world gravitated to the New York hardcore scene, to bands like us, you know? because they felt it was genuine and they felt they could relate to it. And I see it, I see it firsthand. I go to South America, I'm like, Phew. New York City, yeah. again, you know, like these people are living what, and I, they're, and they're what I'm talking it about they're and they New totally York. understand it, you yeah. know? I've been to, uh, you've been to, uh, you've been to all these places I'm talking yeah. about. I remember being in Russia and being bummed out because, you know, I wanted to be with um, 
I, you know, I, I didn't have internet, something so stupid. I yeah. didn't have internet, honestly, and I wanted to see my kids. And it was like, I think it was, it may have been like my, my wife and our, and our anniversary, and I couldn't get, you know? Yeah, that's some real And shit. I was kind of yeah. bummed out, and I was talking to this kid, and uh, you know, he goes, hey, can you sign my records? And I'm signing, he goes, he goes, Roger, you know, I went to prison for three and a half years just to, to listen to this record. I still have it, cause for alarm. Mm. And I looked at him. And, and it just that stuff doesn't didn't fit in, you know, like Russia, it's Russia. You were not allowed to listen to any of music like of our extreme, extreme, heavy, yeah. crazy noise or or politically or something that was banned from from Russia. And this kid did three and a half years for that, man. And he's still here today. You know, that phone call could wait tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, well, it's like this guy did three and a half years. I love that. You know? It's purpose. It's, a, it's, it's having insane. a sense of purpose. The and, and, you... and the New York hardcore scene yeah. bridged that, bridged it worldwide. You know, it's, it's pretty amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, it affected me. I, I definitely wouldn't be the musician I am today or the person that I am today without New York hardcore, for sure. So, legacy, let's talk legacy real quick. Agnostic Front, you guys are still going strong. I mean, how, how often do you guys tour nowadays? Uh, we're pretty busy, believe it or not, but we, we've taken our tour angles a little bit different because we're, we're, we're fathers. Yeah. And uh, we've learned from fallen or broken relationships yeah. and stuff. It's hard, man. Listen, you know, I, it's a glorious life. People think this whole musician stuff and touring, but there's a lot of lonely moments, I'll be mm -hmm. honest with you. You I know, agree. you've oh, experienced yeah. it. Yep. And uh, it's great, it's rewarding, it's beautiful to actually hit the stage. It's like the best feeling in the world. But the 23 hours <laughs> before that, yeah. it's extremely lonely, no you doubt. know? It's extremely like, you know, and throughout the many years, you know, as you get older, you start kind of calming down, you know? I'm not, we're not crazy, you know? We all have children, we all have wives. So all that crazy, let's say we say sex, drugs, and rock and roll, that's all out the window, you know? Yeah, yeah. Those days are done. So we're like looking at each other like, man, you got fat, you know? <laughs> like, oh man, look at this, look at that, oh, this is white hair. We're just like mocking each other. Yeah. That's our entertainment now, you yeah. know? It used to be different, but it's pretty incredible, <laughs> you know? I do know. You know, I'm I'm definitely into that stage right now. You know well. what I mean? So I do, yeah. It's it's enjoy. It's an it's an, it's de definitely when I hit that stage, it's it's beautiful. Well, I would assume it helps having Vinny. I mean, you guys have been. Oh, that guy! That guy will be young, forever. Like forever. I, like I'm really good friends with guys in my band too, and one thing I wanted to mention before this is over, and I'm glad I just thought of this, pasta at Vinny's. It seems like a reoccurring theme in your life. <laughs> Yeah. What for people who don't know, Vinny Stigma is a legendary guitar player for Agnostic Front and one of the most uh, biggest characters I think, in, in probably in music in general. He's a funny bastard. I always tell people he's he's my Eddie. <laughs> you know what I mean? Hell yeah. He's your mascot. Stigma. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about like, what is the significance of having pasta at, at his house? It's amazing. I mean, we used it was religiously almost. If you want to use that word, we would sit down, have pasta. Vinny's mom would cook it up. It was a beautiful pasta meal. And go to CBGB's. You so know, it's just like, it's it was like family like, dinner. <laughs> on point so all the time, you know? That's it's so like, good. Vin, Vinny's, a, Vinny's something else, man. He's, he's a character. Did you see that video he did? Oh yeah, I've seen it in the, the, the little bit. The bits. book one? Did you yeah, see the book yes, one? Yes, I saw the book one. I mean, that came out of nowhere. This guy is, I, I don't, he, hey, he's he, got the book that says Roger on it. Yeah, yeah, I always say he's got a little feeble mind. Something's wrong with him. <laughs> You know, I, I, and I've always said I, someone ought to nominate me for some kind of a Nobel Peace Prize just to deal, deal with this guy for so many years. The, uh, the, the shit I think is funny, too, is when uh, the plugs for Vinny for president, oh. which was, I don't know, what, four, five, yeah. six years ago, maybe? Yeah. I don't even know, but I still rewatch that shit, and it brings tears to yeah. my eyes. <laughs> and he's, he's definitely, you know, like, uh, and I've always been different. And, yeah. and that's the whole thing is that why there's probably a lot of interest of people know stuff about me because I'm, I'm always being more quiet, more reserved. I was an introvert kid, you know, and, yeah. and I just watch. I'm more of a watcher, observer, and then I do what I got to do. And Vinny, Vinny actually one day bought a, a bum to my house and I, I, my daughter was, was like one year old, something like that. And, but not, I'm not just saying like he bought a bum from, from you know, Mott Street where he lives to the Lower East Side. He brought him all the way to Staten Island. I was living in Staten Island. <laughs> and this bomb that he bought with him took the train, took the, uh, the, the, the ferry, mm -hmm. got on another bus, and he brings him there. And I don't, 
and, and he shows up with a, like a, and, you know, and I was like, what are you doing, you know? He's like, oh, I, I figured he, 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 he told me he's from Staten Island. He knows where he's going. And then he leaves and he left him there. <laughs> what the fuck? So I had a, I had a friend that got back to, to the ferry, you know? That's Vinny. He just does the most craziest, outrageous things out of nowhere, like that little book thing. It comes out of nowhere. Nothing's ever planned. It's just the and way it's he just thinks. like, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't think he thinks. I think he just does stuff. <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's entertaining. Yeah. And may I say, you know? <laughs> and that's, that's helped me through the many, many years of our, you know, this roller coaster ride, you know? You know, it's it, Vinny being by my side when you get those days, that, mm. you know, and he just he makes you laugh, you yeah. know? I've had a few breakdowns, and the guys in the van are always there for me. You know which what is else also? Super important. You know what else also is like, um, sometimes, you know, I'm asking my wife or like, because my wife is, you know, she's very down to earth. That's the best thing, the you know, best woman I ever met, you know? And I'm grateful that we're married and everything. But there's times where you're out there and you're like, oh man, you know, it's like sometimes you don't feel like people get it, you know, like, and you're like, oh, you know, you feel like kind of bummed out too, you know what I mean? And then you meet that kid that's like, hey man, if it wasn't for victim and pain, yeah, yeah. I would have never got through high school. I would never got through college. And I look at him, I'm like, man, I never went to high school because of victim yeah. and pain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't have that diploma. I have victim and pain, but uh, that ain't yeah. helping me get a job, you know? <laughs> but I never, and I yeah. look and I, but, but it's, it's such an emotional thing that the fact that, you know, I think my purpose is to, being here in this world is to get people to get through things like we always speak about oppression and overcoming oppression and i see it you mm. know i really do see it well know? and you lived through yeah some crazy shit too which that brings me to the book i read your book in like three days it's incredible what made you want to do that like wh where were you where was your headspace when you're like i gotta do this or did you even feel that way did it just kind of fall on your lap how did that come you know about? It, it, to be honest with you it kind of fell on my lap uh, you know we've always been touring with bands and every time we tour we tell these old stories and everybody loves it and being on the road you know it's back you know going back prior to the book or in the very beginning of the book um you know you sit around at night your show's over you get the next 23 hours away so whatever you gotta do so you're sitting around drinking doing having fun and basically shoot the shit you know talk about this talk about that and you see all the old the newer bands they're thrived on history. They're all around you. And they're like, wow, and wow. And like, you know, like, tell me about this. Tell me about that. Mm. And uh, when we were recording our Ride Ride Upstart record, Lars Fredrickson from Rancid yeah. was, the, um, was our producer. And he came, he stayed with me for here in Long Island City. He stayed with me for about three weeks. And we were shooting the shit again, you know, talking. And he's like, man, Roger, you got to write a book. And I'm like, yeah, you know. He goes, no, you know what? You're going to start right now. Just like that. He goes, really? come on. We went, we bought a tape recorder, a little cassette thing. He hit play. He goes, let's go. Let's start. And that was it. 1990, 1999. If you, if you picked up Ryder Upstar, you see in it, and there's in the line notes, it says, look out for my book. Back then I was calling it Just Us. There's no justice. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. us. Yep. And for years through my touring career, people were like, when's the book? When's the book? When's the book? Well, I lost it during the, the, the the, what happened here in 2001, you know, 9-11 mm -hmm. attacks. Mm -hmm. I lost it again, and I had to switch my... I, so this is a long time. It's a long Coming. journey, man. I'm, I'm, if I tell you, I'm starting 1989. <laughs> Dude. And then children came, uh, and just yeah. life. You know, Agnostic Front, Roger Man of Disasters, The Alligators, Two Kids, the film. And we was just like, I'm overwhelmed. But it finally, I met John who I met through the film, through Ian. Mm -hmm. Ian. Ian saw what I had, too. He wanted to see it. I sent him all, all the stuff. He goes, man, this is incredible, Roger. I want, this is great, you know, plus working on the film. Ian McFarlane, um, who's doing our film, The Godfather's of Hardcore. Yeah, which, yeah. which you Can't may have gotten a peak. I got a peak, okay. yeah. So anyway, he's it's like, I want, I, he's, I, want you to, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine, and he, you know, which I'd done a little interview with him. He says, he wants to help me, which I, we, I introduced me to. But then I had, uh, you know, when, he, when we did talk, me and John, I had this thing, this, you know, this ultra pride about, I want to finish this myself, you mm -hmm. know, like then, you know, you get into that. So yeah, the DIY we had that ethos, man. Right. I, you know, I sent him everything I had. He was blown away. He's like, wow, this is great. You know, uh, I can help you get it in, a, in, a, in an order, you know, so it reads better. And I was like, yeah, thank you. But no, thank you. Fast forward two years later, John out of nowhere hits me back up. He's like, hey, man, how's your book going? You know, I'd love to read more on it. It's, 
I said, John, you know what? I, I talked to my wife that night. She's like, let him help you because there's no way you're ever going to finish this thing. Mm. It's, she tried to help me. And it was, she was like, oh, my God, it's overwhelming with stuff I had. So, and then that happened. And it's the best thing because then... But you get an outside source. Not only, yeah, it, it was incredible because, you know, you're so caught up in it. And, and like we were caught up in the scene and everything that sometimes you don't really know what, 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 what the people on the outside really want to know or what they, you know, so that opened up all these paths and it was very therapeutic for me mm -hmm. to release stuff that I probably wouldn't have done if I didn't meet John, you know, to talk about stuff that I probably wouldn't have talked about if I didn't meet John. So it was, it was good to speak to somebody that had no idea about my life. Right, right. That comes from a whole different place and, and was totally amazed and blown away by what I experienced. And it was just like, whoa, I, I felt like nobody was judging me. No one was coming down on me for anything. I could say whatever I wanted, and I did. And we filled in all the gaps. It filled beautiful. in all the gaps. And it, the story is amazing, you know? And from a musical standpoint, it really helps tell the history of New York hardcore. Another piece of that puzzle, you know? Like you said, the pre-internet age, you know, there's really no way. You can't just go on YouTube and look up you know, this show or that show, that, that's not a thing. So hearing you verbally speak it and have it in writing, you know, let's, let's right here, actually. Oh, actually, yeah. We should probably do this. It, have it in writing, something you can hold on to in this day and age, to me, was super important. You know, people are so used to their phones and their laptops, but, you know, this is a history book for New York Hardcore, yeah. in a way, you know I mean? You're telling your story, but as a fan of music, it's incredible because it's it's a piece of music history as well. Thank you, man. And you know what? I'm 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 honored and I'm proud of it too because, it's you know when I first started writing the book, um, obviously I had a different title. Now it's My Ride Agnostic Front Great Guts and Glory, you know, which is amazing. Everything it felt amazing. It, yeah. And if, if yeah. you look at the original way I started it, it was I was never going to go past Cause for Alarm, you know, and, and we went further. We, and I was never going to go into things I was never going to go. So I'm really happy it turned out the way it turned out because I it would have been different. And well, there's hope. There's hope. the end of this yeah. book, you know, where I think if you had stopped where you did it, it would be different. I mean, the fact that you have a family now, your perspective has changed, you know. Uh, the four stories, did you catch the four stories? Like uh, one is the immigrant story coming from another country. Yes. And that's why I, I, I totally relate to a lot of the stuff that happens today because, you know, I've been there, you know, and I, I know that what it is to be an immigrant. I, I lived it. Yeah, you didn't and even come speak to, English too. I didn't even speak it. You yeah. know what it was when I first came to this country? Let's, let's think about it. My mom was 19 years old. You know, my mom, she was a kid. my mom was 15 years old when she got married on June 30, 1963. Wow. And that was normal, by the way, in Cuba. Everybody gets married young in Cuba, by the way, completely normal. And uh, on June 30, 1964, on her one year wedding anniversary, I was born. And so she comes to this country all by herself with three kids in hand, left everything all by herself. Didn't know how to speak a word of English and unfortunately had, had to go through a couple of abusive relationships, you know, as raising us, our family, you yeah. know. And I went into the school system and they didn't know what to do with me. Of course, I, I fell right into the Latin communities. It's straight up ghettos. And then at that, at that time in life, you don't know you're living in a ghetto. It doesn't even matter. You're with your family. You're mm -hmm. with your mom, your sisters. You're fine. You're safe. You got something over your head. But, um, you know, growing up in these largely communities, which were ghettos, you know, and then going to the school system, all of a sudden now you're in but they were from here. You were talking about the Puerto Rican areas or the Dominican. Back then it was mostly Puerto Rican areas. Dominicans came a little bit later. But they were uh, still Ameri Amer Puerto Rican Americans, you know? Right. Now, now I had to learn how to speak English. So back then they would throw, instead of just teaching normally in a normal class how to speak English or getting some kind of uh, special tutor or something, they threw me with the slow kids, you know? And the, the kids that just didn't get it. Only because I didn't know how to speak English. That's what they did back in the 60s, you know? They didn't and, to deal with you, so they just... Right, and I remember, this is the first time I knew I was walking out of step of society. By the way, I love the name of the show. Thank you. It's you a know? nod. Yeah, you, yeah. You, 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 I get it right away. So, and I'm, that's why I'm referencing walking out of step with society, right. same thing. Yes. So anyway, I was in school, and I remember this day clearly, and, you know, just learning how to read, left to right, normal, normal things we all know. And there's this kid that came from some Middle, middle Eastern country, because that's all I can think of now, that they read from right to left. Is that correct? 
Oh, the yeah. opposite way. Opposite yeah. way. And then I remember the teacher oh, yelling like at him because he was reading this way. And I'm like, I love this kid. <laughs> you know, this is like, wow, I gravitate to him. I want to go this way. And I knew right there and then I'm like, oh, I'm out of step over here. <laughs> That's I so love good. this kid. You know, I wish I could see this kid again. Yeah. You know, this is my influence to punk rock right there. How funny is the that? The guy doing the not was normal. I love him. <laughs> That's great, you know? man. What's a good day for you if you're just on your own? Um, a good day for me, honestly, I love being with my family, my children, and it's, 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 it means a lot to me. I, unfortunately, with my, with my first daughter, mm. with Nadia, you know, she lived through the recklessness and craziness of my life. And I'm grateful that she, we're still, just, you know, we're together, you know, yeah. and, and she, we love each other, you know, everything, it's, you know, she's my daughter. But she lived through this craziness that I was living through, not, me not knowing, or her mom, because her mom was also Amy in the band Nausea. Oh, yeah. And yep. not knowing what we're, you know, we're, and in a sense, we thought we were raising a, 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 a child the, the way the child should see the world, which we did. You know, but she was Well, you being, did the best you could with what you had. Well, in her circumstances, as a kid that was, yeah, you know, born and raised in squats, you know, and, and, and you've seen my life, and I put her through horrible times in life, unfortunately, with the whole prisons thing. And yeah. then, and even going on tour back then, I remember going to Europe for like 10 weeks, maybe 12, who knows, back then, and getting that postcard and making it out to her and sending it to her. And I remember coming home and receiving that first postcard 10 weeks later. Damn. You know, it, that's how it was. Yeah. And, you know, and there was no way to call. First of all, there was no phone in the squad. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. So all I had to, my way of contacting her was writing. And then, so she, she suffered a lot of that stuff. How are you guys these days? Is we're good. We're very good. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you saw a little bit of her in the right. film. And I learned from that. Is that crazy? Is that crazy? I, I, I finally got to, to know what, her feelings, you know? Where does she live? She's in, she's in San Francisco. Oh, right on. She's a very smart girl. Went to Ivy League College. Really? She put herself through it all. Wow. She... The, the impossible things that we thought could never happen. She would do these trips. She would go to Australia for six weeks on, some, on her summer trip, diving. And she was like, Look, I'll, I'll do a scholarship. I'll, I'll do it. And she did it. I was like, okay, if you could do it, you do it. She put herself through everything. That's you know, great. Because she wanted to, you know? She's a very smart girl, Nadia. But anyway, I love, I didn't have that, you know? And, and, and I didn't have that chance to be with my children because I didn't have, we didn't have the internet. Now it's okay for me to go on tour because I see them every day. Yeah. I feel okay, you know? And even though when I do tour, I do it in, in Sprouts because I do have a job home I have to stick to, you know? And I do it in little Sprouts. We all want to be with our kids. So we'll do like maximum three weeks in Europe even though this is the first time we just did four weeks. And we're animals. We went there for 30 days and played 30 shows. We don't have a no day off. off. We don't believe yeah. in it, you know? We just believe in See, I'm a bitch. sheer <laughs> brutality. We're like, if we're going to be here, we're away from our families and Get people we love, sheer brutality. It's all coming at you. Don't give me a day off. I don't want a day off because I don't want to think about home. That, yeah. That's what it comes down well, you're to. You're right, though. You're right. On days off yeah. are the worst. Mentally. Yeah, so I don't want to think about it. Yes. Get, get me going, you know? So that's what I do. I like to spend a lot of time with my children, you know? And, and we do. We, as a family, we all train. In oh, nice. What we do, my, my wife is, is trained. She's an instructor, too. My kid's been training for five weeks, or five weeks, five years. So you you know, we, we have a, yeah, we have, we have, yeah, we have Matt's home. Do you find that that's a good way to, because uh, I have a lot of friends who come from hardcore, have a violent past, and they get into martial arts. It's a way to tame that fight or flight, that tick that's inside. Do you, do you feel like martial arts? Do you f still feel in touch with that violent side of yourself? And does martial arts help? It does, and I don't, you know, because um, I don't, man. I really don't. I mean, there's, there's something in me that really is. I, I'm not going to lie about it. There's something in me that hopefully will never come back out. Mm. And the only way it will is something, somebody does anything immediately, immediate danger to my family, right. then uh, all hell is going to break loose. Right. Cause I know it. I know it's in me, and I wish I could calm that fire. And my wife's seen it here and there. And she's had to calm me down a couple of times. I wish I could, but I think training has helped a lot because you know a lot of my friends who train, um, like you know Billy Biohazard Billy. Oh yeah. Yeah, Billy. He's a black belt mm -hmm. at Gracie Jiu Jitsu, and I remember seeing him at the at the academy in Gracie in um, in 
in California for one of the seminars or bringing my kids to the bigger seminars. Yeah, yeah. And I remember we were just ch chatting like this. He goes, Roger, remember all the crazy stuff we did, all the crazy days? Remember we, you know, he, he looks at me and goes, you know what? We thought we knew how to fight. You know? Right. <laughs> I thought I knew how to fight because what I've learned now, because we're so calm. Yeah. We don't want none of it. Right. We don't, man. We don't. We just want to be relaxed. We, we, we you know, we, we're so much. We want to avoid. We want to be with our children. We know where it could go. But back then, it wouldn't even it didn't spark. Matter. It didn't matter. Yeah. My friend's in a fight. I got, where's the chair? That's what I'm thinking. Well, it's survival. Yeah, where's yeah. the chair? The chair's going over someone's head. <laughs> what I could see, you know what I mean? And I'm glad that I'm not that person anymore. Yeah. I really am because, uh, and it took a lot for me not to be that person. And I, and I, I, I like to can say a lot of it has to, do, has to do with my wife, Emily. It really does. That's great. Yeah, my, she grounded me. My wife does the same for me. She's a, she's a good lady. And she is, and she's, you know, when I try to get her to move here, she's from Colorado and she's from a small town and, she, you know, bringing her to New York, she's like, I can't do it, you know what I mean? Oh, better quality of life where you live yeah. now in Arizona. I got friends. Exactly. A lot of people from uh, touring life live in Arizona. I don't know why, but a lot of my friends, uh, crew people, there's a ton of people in it's Arizona. It's affordable, and you got an international airport. That's it. And, and then you probably just hit it right on the we right pick, there. We picked Arizona out of nowhere because I could have went to Colorado, too. So. Yeah. And it, the thing with her is that uh, I get it. You know, I get it. You know, when I first moved to Arizona, I didn't know what the hell to do. She's yeah. sleeping. Yeah. And I'm like, it's it's 9:30 at night. You know, and she's sleeping. I'm like, this is when I normally get up. Yeah. Like, and there's nowhere to eat. And like, there's no well, noises, yeah. right? Where where do you live? Is and, it quiet? I remember. The, yeah, I remember. She was. Oh, she one time there. You know, she's like, oh, let's just go take a walk around the block. The around the block was like walking around Manhattan. Like the block never ends. You know, like it's just a lot of adop adopting to it, but. You know, I get to go away too. Yeah, you yeah. get it. You know, I yeah. get I get to still enjoy this crazy life because I do. I still go out there, and with my friends. It's or nice with when the you band, can balance touring can balance with home it. life. I, I would assume, right? Because I've been off. This is the first break I've had in five years. I've been home for over three months, and I love little things like going grocery shopping, <laughs> like just little yeah. things that I can't do. You on know, the road. it was really weird when I went to. Uh, with one of my first experience speaking of grocery shopping is I don't even know why I'm talking about this. I remember they I, I, I went to I went to it was a place called Safeway. Yeah. And then they start grabbing my groceries and I'm like, whoa, don't touch my groceries. Yeah. <laughs> really nice. And they start packing it for me. I'm like, I'm thinking these guys are gonna rob me. <laughs> and then they put it in a car and they took it to my car. I'm like I'm like, okay. You know, I'm, I'm I guess I'm gonna give them a tip. Yeah. And my wife said, no, they this is what they this do. Is what they do. <laughs> I was like, it was so awkward. I was like, don't touch funny. my food, you know, like well, you what's can going take, on. You take know? the man out of New York, but New exactly. York is still in your heart. Yeah. Well, listen, man, this is fascinating. I wish we could do this for hours, but I know you have a pretty busy schedule ahead of you. For you guys watching, if, if you haven't read this man's book, definitely read it. Where is it? Let's, let's do this again. Oh, sorry, man. I think that this is important. This is Hardcore History. This is a great book. My man Roger from Agnostic Front. Check out his band. If you don't know who Agnostic Front is, Please check them out. Please do your fucking research and know your history. Dude's a legend. Thank you, Jesse. Brother. Thank you, Appreciate man. That. I appreciate Thank you. you.